words. It's a combination of choices and collective voices. For me, it started as a little kid with the first word uttered, Mama. My words began to take shape. I grew, my words grew, my words grew. Chit-chat, lines, lyrics, tweets. Aw, that's so sweet. Words began to make me. My world of words began to break me. Sisters, parents, exes, spouse kept assuring me. That's pointless, that's useless, that's hopeless. I'm worthless. The boss says it best. It's not personal, it's just business. But that's not true. Not true. Worthless? I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I am a royal diadem in his hand. I am precious in his sight. For he knows the plans he has for me. Plans to perfect me. Words. It's a combination of choices and collective voices. It has the power of life and death. Greetings and thank you so much for tuning in to Living Strong. As always, it's our joy and delight to come your way and uh, spend this time with you in God's Word. And uh, just share the Word of God with you, pray with you, and uh, uh, see you grow and be strengthened in your walk with God. Over the last few weeks, we've been talking about the power of our words, uh, how God has, uh, God, uh, the instructions God has given to us in His Word on how we should use our words rightly. As you mentioned at the very beginning, in, 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 in God's grand design, He has put certain things in place uh, for you and me to understand, to recognize, and make use of. Uh, in the natural world, there are so many things God has put in His design for us, uh, which we have discovered as people, and we continue to discover and continue to make use of those things. And similarly, in the realm of the Spirit, in, in, in the realm of, 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 of our living, God has given us this very important truth concerning our words and how we have to use our words. And uh, He has given us instruction and teaching so that we could learn and then begin to use the, our words the way He wants us uh, to do. So now, as we keep developing the subject on the program today, I want to talk to us about the importance of declaring God's promises with our mouth. And we will look at the life of Abraham uh, uh, to illustrate this. Now, you and I are familiar with the story of Abraham, how in Genesis chapter 12, God called Abraham out of his home country with his promise that, uh, that God would bless Abraham, would give, give, uh, make Abraham into a great nation, and he would bless those who blessed him. And he would curse those who curse him. And he said, Abraham, I'm going to give you a land that I will show you. So Abraham took his wife Sarah, Sarai at that time, and along with all his livestock, and they began a journey to a land that God promised to give Abraham. Now, Abraham at that time was about 75 years old. Uh, his wife Sarah uh, was also well advanced in age, and they had no children. Sarah was barren from the very, uh, from the very beginning, so they had no children. And yet God's promise to them was, I'm going to make you, Abraham, the father of a great nation, which implied that he had to have at least one child. Now, as Abraham journeyed, and he makes his journey by faith, just believing what God has spoken to him, God said, I'll give you a land, I'll give you many descendants, uh, and uh, I will make you a blessing. All the families of the earth will be blessed. Abraham believed what God had spoken to him, and he begins this journey. And, of course, along the journey, several, th uh, uh, several things happen in his walk with God, in his personal journey with God. And we see something very interesting. In the 17th chapter of Genesis, God comes to Abraham and says, Abraham, I want you and your wife to do something. I want you to change your names. Your name is no longer going to be called Abraham, which means father. But I'm going to make, I want you to call yourself Abraham father of a multitude. And I want you to change your wife's name from Sarai, meaning princely, to Sarah, meaning mother of many princesses. 
So from that moment on, Abraham began to do that. He called himself Abraham, father of a multitude. He called his wife Sarah, mother of many princes. Now they, had, they didn't have even one child up until that time. But Abraham began to do that. Now, this changing of name not only uh, is significant uh, in terms of you know, the, the, describing who they were going to become, but this changing of name and them calling each other the, the, by their new name really was them beginning to declare about themselves what God had promised for them. So every time Abraham would call himself Abraham, he would say, in essence, he was saying, I am going to be the father of a multitude. Now, he had no child at, up until that time, but he was calling himself Abraham in accordance to what God said. Every time Sarah would call herself Sarah or other people call her Sarah, they would be saying, you are the mother of many princes. Uh, but she, hadn't, she didn't have even one prince up at that time. But what were they doing? They were declaring what God had promised that they would become. And in setting this in place for Abraham and Sarah, God is speaking to us and teaching us something very important. That part of our faith in the promises of God involves us declaring for ourselves and over our life and over our future what God has promised for us. In Romans chapter 4, verses 17 to 21, God, through the Apostle Paul, points to this faith of Abraham. And he says, this is what Abraham did. He says, as it is written, verse 17, as it is written, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him whom he believed, God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. So he's saying, look, this is how God gave him the promise and God calls things that do not exist as though they did. This is how God works. This is how God operates. He calls into existence things that do not exist. So he doesn't look and say, oh, that's there. And so that's the way it's going to be. But he looks and sees what's absent and he calls into being what does not exist. So he was calling into Abraham's life what was not there, saying, you are going to be the father of a great multitude. Now, Abraham didn't have even one son, but he said, that's what you're going to be. You're going to become the father of a great multitude. So God calls things that do not exist as though they did. Now, God was telling Abraham, you need to start doing the same thing. You need to start calling yourself what I've declared you to be, even though right now in the natural, it does not appear. It's not there yet. It's not in existence yet. But you call things that are not as though they are. So that was what God was telling Abraham to do as he changed his name. And now that is tied into our journey of faith. Verse 18 says, Who contrary to hope and hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations, according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. So against all hope, there was no reason for Abraham to hope like this. But against all reason for hope, he simply believed that he would become what God had spoken that he would become what God had said. Now, part of that journey of faith, as I pointed out, was him beginning to declare the promises of God for his life and for Sarah. He just began to declare. Now, this was not easy because it took maybe 25 years, approximately, before they had Isaac. So can you imagine, for that extended period of time, that's many years, that they would just be declaring about themselves, what God had promised. He'd keep calling himself Abraham. He would keep calling his wife Sarah. But they had no children. And that went on for several years, probably the end, you know, 20 some years. It went on that way. But the Bible says that in verse 19, he was not weak in faith. He did not consider his own body already dead since he was about 100 years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully convinced that what he promised, he was able also to perform. So, what's it telling us? Abraham didn't consider, take, consider the situation. 
He was old, advanced in years. Sarah was barren. Sarah was also old. Those were facts. But the promise of God was this. You're going to be the father of a multitude. Sarah is going to be the mother of a multitude. So he just kept declaring with his mouth what God had said. Declared, his, declared the promises of God through time until he saw the promise actually take place. He did not give up. He did not waver on the promise of God. He did not let the reality of his own body, Sarah's body, the time that was going by, he did not let any of that change what he was speaking. He continued declaring the promises of God, calling into being what was not yet in existence at that time. In Hebrews, the 13th chapter, verses 5 and 6, the writer of Hebrews says, Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me. So the context there is, uh, you know, different things that we face in life. Uh, there could be persecutions and so on. And he says, you know, be content with what you have. And because God has spoken something. God has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So God has spoken something. And what is our response? So we boldly say, what do we say? The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man can do to me. That means we are speaking in alignment and in response to the promise he has declared. He has declared a promise. I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we boldly respond. We boldly say in the midst of every situation, in the midst of every adversity, in the midst of every challenge, our response is in, aligned to what he has said. We declare his promises. We say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man can do to me. God is with me. God said he will not leave me nor forsake me. So in every situation, every circumstance, you and I learn to say what God has said. We learn to declare his promises. Not according to what our situations dictate to us, but according to what God has said. Because he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. We boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do to me. Because he has said, my God shall supply all your need. According to his riches and glory through Jesus Christ. We boldly say in the midst of our needs and, and all that may seem lacking. We boldly say, my God shall supply all of my needs. Because he has said, the Lord is the strength of your life. We boldly say, the Lord is the strength of my life. I will not fear. What can man do to me? You know, we speak, we declare his promise concerning every area of our lives. So let's for, take, for instance, you know, maybe you have faced a series of failures in your business. You've tried several times and things have failed. And of course, you need to um, uh, manage things properly. You need, you need to do whatever you need to do in the natural, take care of things properly. But what are you going to say? Are you going to say, you know, I failed and it's never going to work out? Or are you going to say, God said, I will be like a tree planted by a rivers of water. I will bring forth my fruit in its season. My leaf will not wither and whatever I do will prosper. Will you be able to say that? And that's the way we should say. We should declare his promise. You rise up and say, no, God said, whatever I do will prosper. So I'm going to expect to prosper. These experiences are not going to dictate what I'm going to uh, believe about myself and what I'm going to believe about my future. What I believe about myself, and what I believe about my future is going to be based on what God has said. Because he has said, I boldly say this about your finances, about your future, about your family, about your children, every area of your life. You boldly declare what God has said. You declare his promises. I want us to understand that when we declare his promises, when we declare his word, something very powerful begins to happen. You know, you, you and I understand that the word of God is alive and full of power. Hebrews, the fourth chapter, the twelfth verse says, for the word of God is alive and powerful. The, the word of God 
is full of God's power. It's a carrier of the power of God. It's not just empty words. You know, sometimes we'd say words are empty, but not so with the word of God. God's word is not empty. God's word is full of the power of God. Uh, when God spoke things, uh, he called things into existence. Uh, Hebrews 11 and verse 3 says, By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So that things that appear, things that exist, were not made of things that do appear. That They were not made of things that are in the natural. The visible came out of the invisible. The natural came out of the spiritual. Uh, the, the, the thing that caused the natural to come into existence was the word of God. And so he, uh, Hebrews 11.3 says, you know, we understand this, that it was the word of God that caused all these things to come into existence. So what is it telling us? That the word of God has creative power. It has the power to bring into existence what does not exist. That's, there is creative power in the word of God. So now when you and I agree with God and when we declare his word, when we declare his promises, God's word has creative power. When you and I mix faith with the word of God and declare it, then that word will create in our world what does not exist. That means, for instance, right now, maybe there is no health in your body. Maybe there is no finances or insufficient finances. Maybe there's confusion. Uh, there is no peace. Maybe there is hopelessness, no hope for the future. No, there could be so many areas of lack. But when you speak the word, the word of God creates. It brings into being what does not exist. So God's word has creative power that's released in our lives to bring into being what still, what does not yet exist. So we must understand that as we speak the word, that's exactly what's happening. In Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3, the Bible tells us, now talking about Jesus, it says that he is the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power. He upholds everything by the power of his word or by his powerful word. So the word of God not only brings everything into being, has creative power, but his word has sustaining, upholding, regulating power. The entire universe is regulated, it's sustained, it's upheld, it's kept in place by the power of his word, his powerful word. And so you and I must understand that as we speak the word, as we declare his promises, his word will uphold our lives. His word will sustain us. His word will regulate our world as we declare his promises and speak that, uh, speak his word into our life situations and our, our life circumstances. So the lesson we take away from how God dealt with Abraham in his journey of faith is this, that as we exercise faith in God, we must declare his promises. We must declare his word. The reason we can say his word is because God said it first. He gave it as a promise to us. And so we are just agreeing with God and declaring what he has said. For he has said, therefore we boldly say, because God has said, we affirm, we respond in, uh, in agreement with this promise and we declare his promises. And we hold on to that word, knowing that the word of God will create in our world, knowing that the word of God will regulate and sustain and, and, and uphold our world, our life, um, because that the power of God's word is released as we declare the promises of God. So I want to encourage you in your own personal life, uh, in any, every situation and concerning every area of your life, you declare his promise to you. The word of God is full of promises concerning various areas of our lives. And we take his promise. We keep declaring it. No matter, you know, if we don't see things happen immediately, it's okay. We commit ourselves to declaring his promise. Because God said it, I can say it. Because God promised it, I believe it and I speak it. And when I do that, I know the word of God is so powerful. It's at work in my life. Things in this natural realm will, will come into alignment with the power of God's word. Because it's his word that brought the natural realm into existence. Everything in the natural world is subject to God's word.
because God's word brought them all into existence. Thank you so much for being with us on the program today. Uh, We talked about the importance of declaring his promises. I want to encourage you to start doing that in your life and live that way. It's not just something you do occasionally, uh, but that's the way you always live. You always declare his promises concerning everything in your life. You will see the power of God at work as you do that. Let's pray together before we close. Father, we thank you for the power that's in your word. We thank you, God, that you have taught us how to release the power of that word into our own lives as we declare your promises, things that you've spoken into our, uh, spoken to us in your word. Father, I pray for creative miracles. I pray for circumstances and situations to be changed and transformed as people begin to declare your word in their lives, that they will see the power of your word at work as they declare your word. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for being with us on the program today. And until next time, remember, live life the Jesus way.